So, uh, welcome. I know that we're sort of working into the first hour after lunch, so there's going to be some bonking here, so we'll try and keep it lively. Um, uh, I'm uh, Nick Schmidl. I'm a former fellow here and a staff writer at The New Yorker. And I'm going to be moderating a panel today. Uh, we have one change. Uh, Chief of DC Chief of Police Kathy Lanier was not able to join us, but uh, in her stead we have the very, very able uh, Matthew uh, Bromlin. Uh, we also, next to, to my immediate left is Roy Austin, who is from the White House's Office of Urban Affairs. And to the far left, we have Rabia Chowdhury, who is an attorney, a fellow at New America, and you may know her best from her involvement with Serial, um, <laughs> amongst other things. So uh, um, we're going to talk about uh, community policing, uh, criminal justice, sort of building off of the previous conversation. Uh, we'll talk for about 15, 20 minutes, see if there are questions, and then kind of go from there. Um, I think that we can probably all agree that it's been a fairly bad year for police, um, or at least a very fairly bad year for, for those in the communities who have been affected by a number of incidents. So the first question is sort of, is, is, is for uh, Matthew and for Roy, which is that, are, pol are there, are there more episodes now than in previous years of, of uh, police misconduct, or are there more cell phones that are capturing these episodes? <coughs> Matthew? Go ahead. Right. Whoever's ready. <laughs> Sorry. You know, I, I would actually go with that there are more cell phones, um, because I've been doing civil rights work with law enforcement since the mid-'90s when I was with the Civil Rights Division as a prosecutor, and we went around the country prosecuting uh, hate crimes and police brutality cases. And there's no metric that I can see right now that tells me that anything is particularly different now than it was before, other than the fact that we are actually seeing what's happening. And I think President Obama in his comments, I believe they were post-Ferguson, uh, noted something that you know people need to, need to recognize that in many of these cases, people are not making this up. That racial profiling and issues between community and police have been happening uh, for a long time, but it was always kind of this he said, he said, or he said, she said, or she said, he said, depending on the gender of the officer, thing that was happening, and, and no one could actually tell the story in a way that people would believe it. And suddenly now we have video. Uh, I mean, what has happened in so many communities is not new, this lack of trust that we sometimes see between police and the communities. This is something that's been around for decades. And you, know, and you ask any African-American male about their interactions with police, no matter what their status in life is, and they will tell you that they've had some incident with the police that was very uncomfortable. Uh, and so I, I have to go with the, it's really that people are now seeing it through cell phones and, and increasingly dash cams and body cams. Mm. Matthew? And so just, just by way of also a quick introduction, Matthew has been an advisor to, uh, to uh, uh, Chief Lanier for the past seven years since, since she came in uh, as chief. That was a little after that, but uh, okay. yeah, I've worked directly for her for about seven years. And uh, I apologize that uh, I know that you were all expecting the six foot blonde with a gun, but unfortunately, <laughs> uh, certainly she has a much more compelling story than I do, but uh, I will do my best to uh, represent her and, uh, and the department as a whole. Uh, I think that uh, my perspective is certainly more different than what the chief uh, perceives in her position as being uh, the head of the police department. I'm a more of a, a behind the scenes uh, policy uh, and projects type of person. But I think in terms of kind of the things that, it's given me a different perspective and I would agree uh, uh, with Mr. Austin in terms of, uh, I, don't, I don't think that there's, there's certainly um, more instances uh, of these types of things occurring. Uh, I really think it is just the, the, the ability by which uh, when something does happen, how quickly it can spread across the country or across the world for that matter. It's kind of the globalization of, of, uh, of kind of the issues and the challenges that I think are, are facing police. And I certainly think, I don't know if I'd say it was necessarily a bad year for police, but I would certainly say it was an incredibly difficult and challenging year uh, for police, but I think that part of the uh, part of the reason why I'm in this business, and I was talking to Mr. Austin and, and Ms. Chaudhry, the part of the reason that we're in this business is because we we want to face those difficult challenges. We want to try to affect change 
and uh, make improvements in, in, in both policing and the, and the way that we interact with the community. The, uh, you mentioned that sort of you no longer have the hearsay element. The hearsay element has been taken out with video. I mean, it's obviously somewhat cliche to say that that you know that video is kind of democratizing. But but honestly, there was that moral high ground that was offered by a badge uh, in, in in a dispute over what happened that is that is no longer there with the video. R Rabia, what do you um, sort of having watched the debate and listened to the debate? What do you what do you think is missing from the debate over the course of the past year? What 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 has not been discussed? Um, that, 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 should ha that should be? Uh, first, let me just say thank you for having me, and I also apologize for not being a six-foot blonde with a gun. Um, <laughs> I've always felt terrible about that. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, um, I mean, I think what, to me, really uh, has been missing from this, and you know, I, you know, my relationship to this particular conversation on police brutality as it relates to black Americans is um, tangential because my, my involvement really has been with community relations with Muslim American communities in the context of counterterrorism and CBE. Um, but so as kind of an outside observer, so I would... Countering, countering violent extremism. Right, countering violent extremism. Um, is that uh, I don't see a lot of discussion about the culture of policing. Um, and I feel like, you know, for me, you know, when we examine like why certain pathologies exist, you know, in, in certain institutions or communities or regions or anything, we, we try to kind of look at what are, the, what are the root causes here, what are the cultural issues here. And I feel like so, to me, I mean, I'm, I'm much more um, interested in finding out what, what is this core element of um, treating certain minority groups with a level of disrespect um, and also in a, I mean, the power dynamics are so clear, right, that when you, it seems to me that if once you obtain, when you, when you get a badge, you feel like you have a certain level of power over other people. And so the idea of being a public servant has gone out the window. Um, there's that, and I'm also really concerned about accountability issues. Uh, you know, part of the concern of communities is that even when there's clear police brutality, you're not getting accountability, you're not getting it in the courts, uh, and you're also of, oftentimes not getting it from the institutions. You don't get these, you know, an, a public apology, you don't get Rest, you, don't, you don't get any kind of uh, healing between the community and the institution. It just becomes a standoff. Well, or in the case of, of, as we've seen with the mayor of New York, when you do take a position that sort of is, is, is a, a strong position of, of sympathy or empathy with the community, it has backfired within the police force. And yeah. so there seems to be uh, a very fine line to walk there. How have you all sort of what have you all done uh, to try and both preserve the trust of the community while also pre pre sort of um, preventing a mutiny within the police force? Uh, yeah, I think that's a difficult, I mean, certainly in terms of, and, and let, me, uh, let me be clear, the chief is obviously more than just the six foot blonde with the gun, so I just <laughs> want to make that clear. Um, uh, she's somebody that I respect very highly, and I think that in terms of kind of how deliberate she's been in terms of engaging the community, and then also, uh, what you don't see behind the scenes, how deliberate she's been in engaging the members of the department. I mean, we talk about kind of the cultural aspects of policing and kind of the modernization of policing and the professionalism within, within the profession itself. And I think that one of the things that she's been trying to do uh, and that I've been involved in and some of her other staff members is kind of engaging internally, uh, you know, what, what do we do as a group to identify kind of these issues that, and the challenges that we're trying to face and what are the things that we can do to, together, uh, kind of bring us up that, to that next step, to so, con that so, continual improvement. So you, you've been there for seven years. Have there been, you've been sort of part of these, these uh, war council meetings, I'm sure, on a number of occasions. There has to have been an episode or two that had Ferguson-like potential in D.C., and, and I wondered, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously speculating, but A, can you confirm that there have been an episode of two? Describe what happened and describe sort of what you all did to, to prevent it from, from taking on, uh, from growing out of it. Um, I'm, I'm trying to rack my brain for an, any specific incident. There's probably a, a few, certainly, that uh, could have, uh, uh, I guess, erupted, a potential for erupting into something uh, in terms of uh, the community as a whole. Uh, against the police, so to speak. But I think, again, and it goes back to some of the, the kind of just the chief's approach and the, and the things that she's uh, 
uh, kind of the strategies that she's tried to employ in terms of very, very, very deliberate in terms of her connection with the community, how we engage, the expectations that she sets for the members of the department, not just the officers, but obviously all of her, all of her employees, we all engage with the community on a regular basis. And I think by having those relationships, that positive, constructive relationship from the get-go, uh, it, it says a lot when something, do, when something difficult does occur or an incident may happen, uh, that there's, a, there's, there's an opportunity and kind of a, a patience and an understanding to allow us to have that dialogue so that it doesn't just become uh, an instant, uh, you know, con Can you, you know, give us a, an example conflict. of, I mean, we hear engagement and you think sort of, uh, you know, bake sales. Like, what, what, is, what does engagement mean on a day-to-day? -day? Can you give us an example of kind of what, what is a current initiative that's sure. being done? I think that, you know, the example that the, that the chief always talks about is just the idea of the, the, the standard foot patrol officer that's out there who knows everybody on their block. Uh, who says hi to the, everybody on their street, knows everybody within the neighborhood, knows, knows the guys on the corner, knows the young family that just moved in on the other side of the street, uh, knows the, the woman, uh, the matriarch of the neighborhood who's been there for 70 years. And uh, that's the example that she uses on a regular basis in terms of, you know, before you, you know, the community believes that, um, you know, the police are coming in to take action and then leave, that's not the way that it should be. It mm. should be about having those uh, relationships ahead of time so that when something does happen, you've already established that relationship and those people, the members of the community, have faith and trust with the members that they see out there on a daily basis. Uh, yeah, the, please. The prior conversation was, was very interesting because there was part of it where they were talking about uh, international tribes and the need to ask them what they need for change when it came to, I believe in this case, it had to do with um, something with, with, with childbirth or pregnancy. We're not that different. And I, I go to say we're, we're not different. The police department is a culture. The civil rights advocates, the communities are a culture that if you don't bring them to the table and ask them what they want, then no matter how beautiful your policy may look on paper, mm. no one's going to accept it. And so what engagement is, and we did this, um, I was involved in an investigation of the New Orleans Police Department for patterns or practices of violations of the Constitution. Here's a police department that was broken before Katrina, broken during Katrina, and broken after Katrina. Um, and the officers knew it. I mean, this wasn't a surprise to them. But if we just came in there and said, this is what we're going to do, and here's our list of things that you have to do differently, they, it would have never been accepted. Mm. What we did immediately is we sat down with as many of them as possible. And you put them in a small group away from the lights and the cameras and everybody else, and you ask them, what's going on with your department? What can we do to fix it? They will be incredibly honest with you. This is what we need. We need better training. We need clearer policies. We need officers who do wrong to be held accountable. We need real supervision out there. They know it. And so what engagement is there is bring them to the table, have that conversation, and then you're gonna have buy-in when you present them with what happens. Uh, one, just one real quick story from that whole thing is um, just showing the power of culture. We said right away, you know, officers should not be receiving cash for doing their job. And in New Orleans, you had this system where officers would receive cash for escorting people to funerals or to weddings. So we had the chief institute that right away. Chief said, great, we'll, we'll institute that. Went back like two weeks later and said, chief, how's that going? And he said, you know, let me tell you, they're not taking cash anymore, but now they're asking people for checks written out to cash. <laughs> I mean, it was a culture there that, and, and we just, that was what we were up against, and that's why, you know, change being slow is real, because this is how people have lived their lives generation over generation as to how law enforcement should, should work. There was a, a piece in The Atlantic last week about the, the, the myth of police reform, and it was talking, I mean, essentially saying that we're expecting we're expecting police officers to be law enforcement. We're also expecting them to be community outreach. We're expecting, there's almost like a mission creep that we, a cr criticism of police officers uh, and mission creep similar to the one that's been levied against the U.S. military. The U.S. military is, can, can deliver aid faster around the world after a natural disaster than anyone else, but should they be delivering aid? And I think that's the question. I sort of wonder um, how much, uh, how much can police reform be affected sort of within, by, by police officers, or, or is there, you know, and I'm, and I'm remiss to get into a big conversation about grand strategy, but the, uh, how much of that needs to be wrapped up into other, uh, uh, other offices and initiatives that may not even exist at this point? 
Uh, uh, real quickly, I mean, you're not going to change based on you alone deciding I need to change. Okay, there are going to be outside people who are going to have to tell you and work with you and it's going to have to be acceptance by you of this and it's going to be that the officers really and truly uh, hear it from the outside. So it's both and so in the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing, the, I think it's the very first recommendation is basically move from the warrior mentality to the guardian mentality is what it says. And so police officers have to start to believe that they are parts of the communities that they're there to police, mm. not that they are the invading forces that are going in there to save the community, but this is actually their community. Mm. Well, this isn't going to happen by a police officer waking up one day and saying, okay, I'm gonna be a guardian now and not a warrior anymore. It's gotta be the police officer deciding they wanna do it, but it's also gotta be all of the civilians deciding that that's what they want. It's gonna to have to be the business community deciding that that's what they have to be. It's gonna be the entire community deciding that that's what we want our community to look like for it to actually change. Rabia, what about, what have you seen in the past 14 years? Have you seen an evolution, uh, whether it's in sort of awareness and knowledge by uh, law enforcement of, of concerns and considerations in the Muslim American communities? Or is it, have you, seen, have you been in, in, encouraged by what you've seen at all in terms of education um, awareness? I mean, not necessarily. Um, What's happened in the last 14 years is that um, you know local law enforcement is getting, uh, just like you mentioned, mission creep. I mean, they're expected more and more to not just do their regular job, but also to be uh, aware of uh, things like violent extremism and counterterrorism and all these things. A lot of time, they like, I, you know, I started a firm called Safe Nation Collaborative to be able to provide training for law enforcement officers on a local level to work with American Muslim communities in a respectful way. So they actually know one another. I mean, it's important to understand, you know, the, the culture and the needs of, of a law enforcement institution, but also the community. Like, who are these people? Um, and what are their needs and what are their concerns and what are their histories? Uh, with the American Muslim community, you have a really large population that are uh, immigrants, right? Like, you know, I'm a second generation immigrant. A lot of times these are people who come from countries where law enforcement is an extremely, extremely corrupt institution. If people are terrified of it, you know. I mean, I remember my father once had to go to, once in his life had to go to court for a traffic violation. He was terrified. He wanted me with him as an attorney. And I said, this is not Pakistan, you know. You'll be fine. Um, so, you know, so they have to also understand the community. But what I've seen is, I mean, as anti-Muslim rhetoric um, and sentiment in America generally is actually at higher levels now than it was after 9-11, this impacts all, you know, people across the board including law enforcement officers. Mm -hmm. um, the, we've, we had issue, we, we had concerns around 2009, 2010 that there were like this really broad, um, really negative law enforcement trainings about Islam and Muslims that were just you know, terrifying law enforcement officers and, and security officials. But that's not what happened. I mean, they, they, they existed, but not, it wasn't a wide scale thing. What really happened was that you had more and more anti-Muslim sentiment in the public discourse, in media, in punditry, um, and this was being absorbed by Every, all kinds of people, including law enforcement officials. Um, the University of Maryland, their START program, uh, did a study a few years ago where they asked uh, you know, state-level law enforcement to respond to what were their, some of their major concerns uh, about you know, the, the issues that they're facing. And about 90% said that one of their major concerns was jihad in their neighborhoods. Okay. It's like an existential fear, right? right. But they're, they're not putting any training towards it. They don't get any training towards it. It's just something that occupies a space <laughs> in their heads and probably impacts how they're you know, interacting with the community. So but, this is a concern. Um, I once had an intelligence officer tell me when she needed, when she was doing analysis of you know, these types of issues, you know, maybe some, some communication came by, and she needed to understand something from, you know, about Islam or Muslims, she would Google it. You know, like, you know, that's dangerous <laughs> to Google something like that, because as a Muslim, if you've Googled stuff like that, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, don't do it. Don't do it. Um, so, you know, I, I don't necessarily see, but, you know, so to me, it's, it's less that there is an actual, you know, uh, actual issues like, you know, that, that law enforcement folks are facing with the American Muslim community. It's more like a fear, and that fear has been growing over right. years. And I suppose, I mean, if you think about the, the um, AP expose a couple of years ago about the NYPD spying in, in, in New York mosques. I mean, 
that, I'm sure we all know about that story inside yeah. of this room, but that story had so little sort of widespread resonance sure. yeah. that if that would have happened in a, in a, in a, in a non-Muslim community in the United States, I feel like it would have, it would have been yeah. a, a much more enduring story. Yeah, they've been a, they've been a complicated uh, force to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, two of the recent shootings, um, one involving Eric Harris, the Oklahoma man who was shot by Robert Bates, a police officer, when Bates claimed that he was reaching for his taser and pulled his gun instead. And then uh, Tamir Rice, the Cleveland boy who was shot in a park recently when a police officer mistook Tamir's toy gun for a real gun, seem reflective of, of just poorly trained police officers. Um, Roy, do you think there are, are, are too many men and women who have been granted the moral and legal authority to exercise lethal force? <laughs> um. Let me start by saying I, I, I simply cannot talk about specific incidents, and, and any specific incident is actually the province of the Department of Justice. I, I, think, I think training is a piece of it, but I, I think going to what Robbie had just said, you can train someone to death, and the, the problem is, uh, and that analogy was not meant that way, um, but at, at the end of the day, people have to have familiarity. And so I can tell you everything I want to tell you about a Muslim American, but until you sit next to one in your patrol car and really understand it, you're not going to change the behavior. Mm. I, I think you're ending up with the same thing in a lot of these police departments where you have this initial fear of young black men. Okay? It's there. Um, there have been studies that have shown that the adrenaline starts to pump. Your reaction is immediately one of hostility, of anger, of of protection, and that's going to influence whether or not you, you pull that gun. It's going to influence your stress level. It's going to influence everything that you do. If you have this immediate fear, I'm in, a, I'm in a high drug area. It's dangerous. There are a lot of black people here. There are a lot of young black men here. That's all building up, and that's part of it, and as far as I'm concerned, what's leading to some of these incidents. And until you actually understand that, 90% of these communities are just people who, you know, 99% of these communities are just people who want to live their lives, mm. um, are, are just as concerned about the violence as you are, you're not going to behave in a way that's going to ensure that you don't end up with these really tragic incidents time and again. So this seems like a, a good point to sort of to, to, to pivot to body cameras. Um, Chief Lanier has, has shown uh, an acceptance to adopt body cameras. Um, but in light of that first question about whether these instances of police misconduct are, are, are more rife now or whether it's just the fact that there are cameras everywhere, can, can the community, can, can the sort of, can the communities uh, survive the publication of so much awfulness if there, in fact, are now body cameras capturing all of these episodes that have just simply been sort of swept aside maybe over the course of the past dec few decades? Um, well, I think there's a, a well, I guess the, the first part of that question, I think there's, there's an underlying assumption then the way that you position that question that there, it will capture more incidents such as, such as that, we're, that we're discussing. Mm. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily true. I think that um, the cameras in and of it, you, you have to remember that it, at least in Washington, D.C., and that's all I can really speak for right now, is that uh, you know, our officers, we have hundreds and hundreds of officers on the street at any given time, and they are having thousands of interactions with uh, the citizenry on a daily basis. And 99.9% .9 of those interactions are innocuous. They're, uh, uh, you know, it might be somebody uh, just greeting somebody. It might be somebody following up on a complaint. It might be somebody taking a report. It might be somebody comforting a victim. Uh, so I think that, you know, and the chief has said this, that the cameras, they're not a silver bullet. They're not gonna be a silver bullet. I mean, they're not gonna solve everything. There's still, you know, even when there's video, there's going to be uh, discussion and discourse in terms of, and probably disagreement over how that's perceived. But I think that the cameras in and of itself, uh, you know, what we're trying to see is if, if they're going to, ch you know, change the way that people interact with one another for the better. Uh, and I think on a whole that, you know, what we're seeing in some terms of some of the pilot uh, parts of it, uh, the, 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 that's the case. So. Well, in terms of accountability, um, I mean, as the Eric Garner episode showed, you know, the whole thing's captured on camera and yet you still have a grand jury that's not willing to indict. Um, I know you can't talk about specifics, but uh, there, every, every, every police shooting in the district is, is reviewed by, uh, by the U.S. Attorney's Office. Roy, is there, is there appetite and capacity for U.S. Attorney's Offices around the country to take on every police shooting and review it 
uh, that, that happens at a state and local level. Well, there's absolutely not capacity. There are approximately 1,000 fatal police shootings every year. Um, these investigations, I've been involved in a lot of them, including in Washington, D.C. Um, you, you, you simply, the amount of time that it takes to look at every thing, the, every witness, uh, every piece of evidence uh, that is involved with these is, 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 is enormous. Um, but you do need to figure out who's going to do that. And I think, as the, again, the task force on 21st century policing talks about, taking it out of the department and having some outside agency being the one to look at it. Not only, you know, and that's not to say that internal affairs and the departments aren't going to get it right, but people don't feel like it's an honest investigation if the people who are involved in it are part of the same force. And so departments need to team up with outside departments and say, hey, if we have a fatal shooting, will you be the ones to look at this thing? Mm -hmm. And that's going to give at least people some trust in the process, and I think that's an important piece of this. The, uh, the, the, I, feel most, I feel like the, the sentiment generally is that body cameras are a good thing. In, in the Muslim American communities, I suspect it's interpreted a little bit different. There's a little bit of a surveillance you know, uh, undertone to it. Do you think that the, that the um, is it as widely accepted, is your sense that it's as widely accepted in the Muslim American communities as it is elsewhere? Oh, I think absolutely, because I mean, a body camera means that you are having a face-to-face -face interaction with a law enforcement officer which is much more welcome than never seeing them but knowing they're watching you. Because that's what's happening in the American Muslim community. So the surveillance issues don't, are, are very different than, than you know, any kind of concerns uh, related to body cameras necessarily. Mm. Um, and that's you know, one thing that uh, a lot of uh, people, especially Muslims working with government and policy level, want to encourage um, Muslim communities to be more open to working with law enforcement, getting to know them, you know, taking away the, security, kind of the securitization of that relationship um, and so if they're, they're working face to face with a body camera, I think they'll be just fine with it. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, you, the former of the office that you were with the Department of Justice had, I think in 2013, found a pattern of excessive police force in the Miami Police Department. There was an almost identical finding from the Department of Justice about the same police force 10 years earlier. H who, who, who does that, where, where's the accountability there? Is that, is that a lack of, I mean, with the Department of Justice, if they are not prosecuting and they're just coming to findings, do these things have any teeth? Yeah, so I, I can't speak to the earlier one because I wasn't involved in that one, but I can, I can talk a little bit more about, about what we did more recently. And the difference is, is, is the, uh, and this is really under Tom Perez, who's now the uh, um, Secretary of Labor, and Eric Holder's leadership is a real push to, to consent decrees and real agreements. Mm. Uh, as opposed to the past where we'd make our findings and there would be some kind of agreement between that party and maybe the Department of Justice that was largely unenforceable to having an independent court being the one uh, and, and bringing on a, an independent monitor to be the one. So that's what we did in New Orleans, that's what we've done in uh, Portland and Seattle and East Haven, Connecticut, and in numerous places around the country. So not only did we bulk up the program, but we made the requirements even more strict. But let me just say one thing, though, that, we, that has to be made clear. Police officers do have a hard job. There's some awful, awful crimes that happen uh, that police officers have to, have to uh, address. Um, and so we have to keep that in mind uh, at the same time, because we will be the first ones to call the police when something horrible is happening. And if we don't put some trust in them, um, then that's going to make that, more, that much harder for them to do the things that we're asking them to do. So this is a balance, and, and you have to find that balance, and you have to believe that the, the, the men and women who choose to be police officers both want to and can do the right thing um, more often than not. Right, right. But I, I, I suppose I, the re I was asking because I had spent some time last year in Chicago doing a story that involved uh, a number of, of, of uh, Chicago police officers who had come under heavy long-term allegations about police misconduct. And it wasn't, and there had been Cook County State Attorney's Office's findings, there had been Chicago Police Department findings, but none of them had any teeth. It wasn't until the U.S. Attorney's Office got involved and indicted John Burge that suddenly people took notice. And I sort of wonder, I mean, is that, does, you know, the feds obviously are not a panacea to, to step in on all of these affairs, but sort of how do you, you know, how do you say take grand jury, uh, how do you take grand jury decisions out of the state and local environment and sort of, you know, you can't put everything in the federal hands, but where's, where's, the, where's the balance there? <laughs> I mean, I would, I would just say 
the John Birch case was done by the Civil Rights Division in Washington, D.C., along with the Civil Rights, along with the Chicago U.S. Attorney's Office. And that's the importance of having a Civil Rights Division in Washington, D.C., because we were able to go into communities and not be of those communities. And so there, at least, there was at least some trust in the decision making that was being done. You look at the Ferguson case, where it was the Department of Justice that found, um, with respect to uh, the death of Michael Brown, that there was not a prosecutable case there, but also found that the police department had serious issues. Again, it's an outside agency making that statement, which I think gives it some more trust uh, to the public, and that, that you know this is these are people who looked at this seriously and probably got it right. Um, so we have about seven minutes left. Uh, are there questions? Anyone? Please. here to help you. And then the experience of, as they get older, if the police pull you over, even if you know you've done nothing wrong, you have to be very careful. How do I explain that to my children? My husband and I have police officers on both sides of the family. And how do I explain to them when my husband comes home from walking the dogs, upset, visibly, because again, in our neighborhood, he's been pulled over by the police, asking what he's doing walking our dogs in our neighborhood. What do I say as a mother? Oh no, uh, this is for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to hear both sides. No. Um, I think that uh, <laughs> that's a question that uh, I've been with the chief at community meetings, and there's been members of the community who have asked that question. I live in D.C. I live in, a, in an area of D.C. that has historically been a relatively high crime area. My wife and I have a place here and have lived here for well over a decade. And I think that my neighbors, their kids, I mean, that's a, that's a difficult question. And I'm not trying to avoid it as much as I, I would say kind of the honest conversation with them. And, when, and the thing that I would encourage any parent with any child is that you know, you have those conversations early and often, and that you have an opportunity to engage the police officers within your community. I think that's really the key, uh, kind of the key aspect of this. Uh, Mr. Austin has probably seen that in terms of kind of the work he's done, uh, and even Ms. Rodriguez. I'm sure that, that that she's seen kind of the positive relationship that that kind of that starts young in terms of the interactions that, that your your kids will have with the police officers in the neighborhood. And if you're there for a long time, I think you know, as they grow up, the police officers become aware of who, who your children are, too. Uh, and I think that uh, it all starts with that, uh, that positive relationship from the start. It, it all begins there. I, I don't know the answer to that question. I have a 12-year-old son. I have not had that conversation with him because I have no idea what I would say to him. Um, because I've been stopped and in, in, been in those situations where you're helpless. You're, you're, I mean, the power dynamic is so overwhelmingly in favor of the police that you're completely helpless. It's why I do what I do is hopefully to try to help some of these departments do better and hope that he has a better chance later on in life if he's ever in that situation and that, that, that the officer on the other end of that is an officer who can be trusted. But I, I mean, I, I don't tell him to run. I don't tell him to fight back. But, I, but at the same time, do you just sit there and take it? Um, it's part of why I believe so strongly in the body cameras. We've seen it from rudeness to the, the shootings. I mean, you want to make sure that people are held accountable for that behavior, though he's absolutely right. In most of those interactions, it's perfectly fine. And those aren't the ones that are gonna garner any press, but it's gonna be a, a completely professional um, interaction. But in far too many, it's not. And I, I, I don't have the slightest idea what I would tell him if I have to have that conversation with him. And I, and I need to, but I don't know what to say. Please. I'm Meredith Wadman. I'm also a fellow with the New America Foundation. Um, my 14-year-old son loves skateboarding, and he and six or seven friends were down in Roslyn near the Key Bridge skateboarding a few nights ago, actually a couple of weeks ago now. And um, they got to acting like 14-year-old boys do, I'm sure, and they were shoving each other around, and someone in one of the apartments must have called the police, and suddenly they were surrounded. And these guys were just, now granted, I only have one point of view on what happened, but apparently these cops, and these kids were all white, by the way, which is interesting, 
separated these kids, scared the living daylights out of them, saying you're going to have an arrest record, your college career is going to be ruined, and this and that, and just were really gratuitously awful. And my son came home and said, you know, now I, 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 I'm going to think about place a different way for the rest of my life. And, you know, I can only imagine if, uh, if you know, my son had been black-skinned. And I didn't know how to come back to him and say, all cops aren't like that. It sounded Pollyanna-ish to say that in that particular context. And I'm still furious at these guys, and I wanted to make a complaint. And my son was like, no, no, you'll make it worse. And, you know, I just... I just left it, but it's been eating at me and it's come back to me as I've been listening to you guys. I'd just be interested for any input about how to talk to him going forward about how to see, how to see cops. Well, you really need to issue that complaint because that's the problem, is people don't know that this is happening. And that's one thing when, with all of our consent decrees, we put a very strict requirement that every officer has to be able to take a complaint. You have to be able to put it in uh, in every station house. Uh, more and more, we're looking at what technology might be able to do to make the complaint process easier. I mean, everyone has a phone. Can you make the complaint right then and there on the phone? But if no one knows that that happened, then when is the behavior ever going to stop? And so that, that's the problem. And, I, and I, I get your son's position too. Look, I just want to live my life. I just want to skateboard. I don't want to end up being dragged into court having to tell some investigator about what happened in this incident. But if, if you're silent about it, no one ever knows that it happened. Actually, can I, can I, if, I if I can just respond? Um, and I, also, I had a thought about the previous question, too, because, I mean, and this is, it's kind of sad, but, you know, as uh, the mother of two children who have grown up in the shadow of 9-11, they have no idea what the United States, what, what it was like growing up as an American before 9-11 and before people thought of you a certain way. Um, I've had to basically tell them, uh, you know, teach them about, I mean, you teach children about all kinds of dangers, right? Pred online predators and, you know, stranger danger and all. And this is like literally one more thing that they have to be careful about. That as I have a teenager, listen, if an FBI agent comes to you, this is how you have to handle it. This is, these are the things that could get you in trouble where you have no idea that you're just, you know, you don't even, so I mean, I, you, I have to prepare them for all kinds of realities, but at the same time, um, just to cut some slack to the law enforcement officers, a lot of times uh, what people on the other end of it don't understand are the kinds of choices and decisions that law enforcement has to make. Um, and what's been really informative for me is being part of these roundtables uh, in different parts of the country where you have federal law enforcement, local law enforcement, um, a national counterterror center, and then you have um, Muslim activists and faith leaders and, and even like college students all getting together and going through a scenario together that, you know, these are the, a number of things that have happened. How would you handle this? At what point would you start to investigate? At what point do you make an arrest? And across the board, all the, Mus the Muslims would make an arrest like weeks before the law enforcement officers. They're like, oh, that's shady. No, no, you've got to make an arrest. Um, because suddenly they're put in that position and they understand the kind of really difficult choices. That, uh, so even in a situation like this, I mean, maybe, for example, if you were to ha be able to have that conversation, and, th and it's hard because I know um, institutionally, you know, they, they sometimes can't respond. But if you know that maybe there's been some gang activity, maybe there's been some violence already in the community or something's happened that caused a certain reaction, um, it might be more, you know, you might be able to understand that. Part of, part of the challenge, though, is then getting that response of it being explained to you, you know. Um, so anyhow, I, those are just some thoughts that I had. So we've, we've unfortunately run out of time. I, I do want a last word here before we wrap up. I just want to say file a complaint. I want to echo what Mr. Austin said because I think that it, by, and, I, and again, I don't want to trivialize kind of the, the, the trauma that your son went through, but I think it's important that if coming from the kind of the law enforcement side, if, if nothing's said, it perpetuates that strategy for that, those officers. They believe that strategy works, right? And I think that if anything, the, the thing that we're trying to do is try to change that aspect that it doesn't have to be scary. You don't have to be a big scary person to be a police officer, that it is more about being, uh, you know, a friendly. What happened to the officer friendly of, you know, of, of decades ago? And there's nothing wrong with that, even with all the different threats, even and how difficult the job is as a police officer, that's, you know, it's part of their responsibility. And they can engage people in a much respectful and more, uh, you know, humanizing kind of way. So I absolutely think you should file a complaint. I do. Right. Well, thank you all for joining us, and thank you uh, for coming to the panel. Thanks. Thanks.